now a series of votes on the floor of the House that's caused a recess in that hearing. We take you live now to the floor of the Senate where we expect senators to continue debate on a six-month federal spending plan. Live coverage now on C-SPAN 2. The Senate will come to order. The chaplain, Dr. Barry Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we praise your name for all those who answer the call to serve you and country. We confess that we often pay honor to people who labored for liberty long ago, but we sometimes neglect to appreciate those who sacrifice for freedom today. Forgive us when we resist those in our own time and in our own associations who for our own good and for the good of the nation, challenge our rigid ideas of thought and patterns of action. Make our lawmakers this day open to greater creativity in their convictions so that they may become partners with you in these challenging times by paying the price for unity, we pray in your merciful name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which we stand, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., September 21st, 2012, to the Senate. Under provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Richard Blumenthal, a Senator from the State of Connecticut, to perform the duties of the Chair. Signed Daniel K. Noway, President Pro Tempore. Mr. President. The Majority Leader. I move to proceed to count number 504. The clerk will report. Motion to proceed to calendar number 504, S. 3525, a bill to protect and enhance opportunities for recreational hunting, fishing, and shooting, and for other purposes. Mr. President. The Majority Leader. Next hour will be equally divided between the two leaders or their designees. The majority will control the first half, Republicans the final half. As I think we should know, and I will be happy to restate it, the next roll call vote will occur about 1 a.m. this morning, hour after we come in. I'm, hope, of course, hopeful that we can work something out in order to complete our work, either do it all tonight, do it tomorrow, or if that doesn't work out, as you know, Mr. President, under the rules of the Senate, we would have that vote at 1 a.m., and we've had another vote on the CR, final passage of that would be Sunday morning around 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. And then that would be immediately followed on the most proceed to the sportsman's package. But we continue to have discussions. We're working to see if we can schedule these votes at a more convenient time to senators. But it'll, it's going to work. Everyone should know we're going to finish uh, by Sunday morning. We're not going to go into next week. S3607 is at the desk, due for a second reading. The clerk will read the title of the bill for the second time. S3607, a bill to approve the Keystone XL pipeline. 
I would object any further in regard to this. The objection having been heard, the bill would be placed on the calendar. Mr. President, over the past week, I've listened to my Republican colleagues come here to the floor and lament how little the Senate has accomplished during the 112th Congress. I, above all, share that concern. But in fact, it's a wonder we've gotten anything done at all concerning the lack of cooperation Democrats have gotten from Republican colleagues. I've said it before, but this bears repeating. In my time as Majority Leader, I've faced 382 Republican filibusters. That's 381 more filibusters than Lyndon John faced during his six years as Majority Leader. Time and time again, my Republican colleagues have stalled or blocked perfectly good pieces of legislation to score points with the Tea Party, and they've done nothing but hurt the middle class in this process. Even the most non-controversial consensus matters, items that would have passed by unanimous consent in the past, they've obstructed or stalled. Take, for example, Mr. President, the bipartisan sportsman's bill. The junior senator from Montana has assembled a broad package that Senator Tester, a broad package of legislation to support the needs of sportsmen across the country. And just so everyone understands, I'm not making this up, Mr. President, there's more than 50 groups, 50 organizations in this country who support this legislation. It's a wide range of organizations. National Rifle Association, Ducks Unlimited, American Sports Fishing Association, which, by the way, has more than two million members, Boone and Crockett Club, National Shooting Sports Foundation, Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, Nature Conservancy, National Wildlife Federation, Trout Unlimited. And if you put labels on these, just these 10 organizations I've mentioned, it goes from the more conservative, many would say, National Rifle Association, to the more progressive, Trout Unlimited. So, Mr. President, I would ask you now to consent that these organizations that I have referred to, the 10 plus the others, be made part of the record. Without objection. Mr. President, this measure combines about 20 bills important to the sportsman's community. Bills that would promote hunting, fishing, and recreation. They would foster habitat conservation through voluntary programs. <clears throat> and more than, as I've indicated, more than 50 national sportsmen and conservation groups support this bill unequivocally. <clears throat> this legislation should be passed like that. As I indicated yesterday, I've read Hill papers here, uh, Capitol Hill papers, where Republicans, senators, said, what a great piece of legislation. I'll vote for it. So we should pass this in a matter of seconds. We shouldn't be spending all this time on it. But it's one of those things where there shouldn't be a fight, and there has been a fight. So I would hope that as we try to get back to working in campaigns and doing the work, things that we have to do at home, that we could move along and get this done. In the process, though, uh, we're holding up a lot of other things. But I hope, I'm hopeful that we can get something done in the Iran containment resolution, which is something Lindsey Graham, Senator Lieberman, and many others, Senator Menendez, have pushed very hard to get this done. I hope we can confirm our ambassadors to Iraq and Afghanistan, and the continuing resolution to fund the government for six months. Republicans say this Congress has been unproductive, but if Republicans want to know why it's been unproductive, they should take a look in the mirror. Benjamin Franklin once said, quote, well done is better than well said, close quote. Well done is better than well said. So it's time Republicans stop talking about how much they want to get things done and started working with us to actually get things done. The Republican leader.
Yesterday, dozens of Republican senators came to the Senate floor one after the other to register their complete uh, frustration with the way Democrats are running this place. Never before, never, have a president and a majority party in the Senate done so little to address challenges as great as the ones our nation faces right now. Never. I mean, we've got a $16 trillion debt, and they haven't bothered to put together a budget in three years. They haven't passed a single appropriation bill. They haven't passed a defense authorization bill for the first time in a half a century. These things are usually about as standard as turning the lights on. They haven't done any of them. It's a disgrace. Think about it. If the Middle East is in turmoil. We're fighting a war in Afghanistan and against Al Qaeda, and they can't even bother to pass a defense authorization bill. So we're fed up with the way this place is being run. No legislation, no amendments, no action on taxes, no action on defense cuts, nothing. And now we're at it again. All Republicans want to do is extend government funding for a few months, and the majority leader won't even do that unless he can squeeze in yet another political vote. Democrats have treated the Senate floor like an extension of the Obama campaign, <clears throat> treated the Senate floor like an extension of the Obama campaign for two years. Two years. Now they're holding the CR hostage for no other reason than to help one of their incumbents on the campaign trail. Well, we're ready to vote on three bills, the same ones the majority leader asked for votes on earlier this week. We've got responsibilities to meet. Let's meet them and leave the politics of the campaign trail where it belongs. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the following hour will be equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees with the majority controlling the first half. Senator from Illinois. <clears throat> Mr. President, I listened to the statement made on the floor by the Republican leader, and it was a statement similar to one that was made yesterday. I responded to it yesterday, and I would like to make a response today. I am disappointed that this session of Congress has been so unproductive, but I know the reason why. It isn't for lack of effort. We have tried to bring to the floor time and time and time again legislation to help create more jobs in America, create a more positive business climate, create more consumer confidence in middle-income families, and we have consistently run, run into the same problem over and over again. You see, Mr. President, in the last six years, since Harry Reid of Nevada has been the majority leader on the Democratic side, the Republicans have created 382 filibusters. 382. How does this compare with previous years? There's no comparison. We have never, ever, in the history of the United States Senate, run into such a consistent strategy of obstruction by one party in the Senate. It was no surprise, because the senator from Kentucky who just spoke announced at the beginning four years ago exactly what his strategy would be. He said his number one goal was to make sure that Barack Obama was a one-term president. Now, Mr. President, I've served in the House and the Senate with Republican presidents, and certainly I supported their opponents in whenever they ran for election, but I felt a moral and civic obligation to do my best to work with those presidents to achieve some things for this country. Senator, Senator, I would say that President George W. Bush is a classic example. He and I saw the world so differently, and yet when it came to specific issues, I was prepared to stand up and not only praise his work, but join him in trying to pass important legislation. President George W. Bush may not be remembered for this, but he should be. He spoke out in favor of immigration reform. When's the last time you heard a Republican leader speak about immigration reform? 
But George W. Bush understood it, and I admired him for it and complimented him for it, as I do today. He stood up and said the United States should lead the world in eradicating the HIV AIDS epidemic. And he put his money and the money of the American taxpayers where his promises were. And I supported him for it. He was right to do it. President George W. Bush stood up after 9-11 and reminded America, we are not at war with people of the Muslim religion. George W. Bush told us it is a good and peaceful religion. Those who would corrupt it, those extremists in the name of Islam, are not a credit to that religion and don't reflect it. And I admired him for that at a time when America was so angry over 9-11 and the loss of all those innocent lives. He showed real leadership. What a contrast with those who come to the floor of the House and Senate and say our number one goal is to make sure this president fails no matter what he tries. That's not good for America. And that is one of the reasons why we have been as unproductive as we have been. But there have been exceptions. Let me tell you some of those exceptions. We passed the Violence Against Women Act, an important piece of legislation. Go to a domestic violence shelter. I'm sure you did, Mr. President as Attorney General in the state of Connecticut and as United States Senator. As I did and sat across the table from a victim of domestic violence, this poor woman with two black eyes crying her heart out, saying, I just had to get out of that house. Go to a domestic violence center in Little Village or in Pilsen in the city of Chicago where immigrant women come in holding their children close by for fear that that drunken husband is going to take another swing at them or at her. And tell me that we couldn't agree, Democrats and Republicans, to put the resources together to protect those people. Well, we passed it over here, passed it in the Senate, bipartisan vote, and it died in the House of Representatives. Same thing happened on important legislation like transportation. That used to be the easiest bill to pass. Who in the world elected the House and Senate does not want to see better highways and bridges and, and runways uh, and ports across America. We know it's key to our economic development, and we passed it on a bipartisan basis. What happened? It died in the United States House of Representatives. They ended up sending us a shell of a bill so we could go to conference and finally come up with something. And then the farm bill. This one troubles me. Mr. President, I know Connecticut has some farmers. We have a few more in Illinois. And my farmers have been through a pretty tough time of it. This summer has been exceptional when it comes to weather. Every, virtually every county in my state has been declared a disaster area because of drought. It used to be routine on the 4th of July to have shoulder-high corn and to watch in August as it just uh, grew even more and was ready for harvest. It was a magnificent scene I've seen every year of my life. This year it was a sad scene in too many places in Illinois. Our farmers, many of them will get through. 80% of them bought crop insurance. But they want to know what the farm bill is going to be next year so they can get ready. Well, we told them in the Senate, we passed a bipartisan farm bill in the Senate. Senator Debbie Stabenow of Michigan, what a great example of leadership. She not only put a good farm bill together, she brought Pat Roberts, a Republican from Kansas, on her committee with her to the floor and passed it with 64 votes. Bipartisan bill. And it not only wrote the farm programs for the next five years, it saved $23 billion, cut it off the deficit. Pretty good work. Proud of her. So what happened to that important bill that we sent to the House of Representatives three months ago? It died. The House announced this week they were unable to pass a farm bill. Do you know why? For the same reason they've been unable to pass major legislation through the course of the last two years. They insist that it be passed only with Republican votes. Two of the bills I mentioned, transportation and farm bill, have traditionally been the most bipartisan bills to come to Congress. Why? Because we all share a concern about the infrastructure of America and the agricultural sector of America, Democrats and Republicans. But those bills have died in the House of Representatives. When the Republican Senate leader comes to the floor and talks about how unproductive we've been, he fails to mention 382 Republican filibusters, an all-time record of obstruction. 
He fails to mention his promise to make sure that his guiding principle will be the defeat of this incumbent president. And he fails to mention that graveyard of important legislation across the rotunda in the U.S. House of Representatives. That is the reality. And the reality is a troubling one. Yesterday I did satellite radio feeds back to Illinois and television feeds. And a number of the reporters said, well, what can we do about it? And I said, you get your chance, November 6th. Decide. Decide what you want. Decide if you want to send Democrats and Republicans to this Capitol with an awesome responsibility and also with the spirit of consensus and cooperation. We've had one Senate candidate in the Midwest who announced, I'm not going to compromise with anybody when I get to Washington. I hope the people of Indiana remember that on November 6th. If that's what they want, that's what they'll get. But I sense the American people want more from us. They want us to work together. And there have been instances, examples, where that's happened. President Obama created a deficit commission called the Simpson-Bowles Commission. Eighteen people appointed to it. Senator Harry Reid asked me to join the commission, and I did. I didn't think much would come of it. To be honest with you, there have been a lot of commissions around here. They spend taxpayers' dollars and a lot of time and generate reports that are quickly forgotten. This was an exception. Simply because Erskine Bowles and Alan Simpson came together and did an extraordinarily good job. We spent a year looking at this budget and realizing that this deficit is unsustainable and unacceptable. We borrow. 40 cents for every dollar we spend in this town. Whether we're spending it on food stamps, on missiles, on foreign aid, on agricultural programs, we borrow 40 cents of it. And who's our number one creditor in the world? The same nation that is our number one competitor in the world, China. How about that? We're borrowing money from China. And borrowing that money, of course, is at the expense of interest payments, which continue to grow because of the cost that we are faced with uh, across the board. So we talked in the Simpson-Bowles Commission about coming up with a way to reduce the deficit in a responsible fashion. I was certain when I walked in the door that we weren't going to get much done there, and I was even certain that I wasn't going to vote for it because I thought there were some issues here I just can't see my way through. But I came to a different conclusion. I voted yes on a Simpson-Bowles Bipartisan Deficit Commission. And out of the six senators who sat on the commission, three Democrats and three Republicans, five of us voted yes. We believe that it showed the path to a responsible reduction of the deficit. Well, it didn't go any further, unfortunately, because the commission didn't have 14 votes, which it needed, and it didn't have the power of law, which it needed. It turns out that the original legislation creating the commission had failed on the floor of the Senate when seven Republicans switched their votes and voted against it. After co-sponsoring it, they voted against it. But, thank goodness, the ideas behind Simpson-Bowles are still alive and continue to be alive. We've continued to meet. We've had Democrat-Republican senators meeting almost nonstop for a long time, trying to push forward this concept of reducing the deficit in a responsible way while still growing our economy and creating jobs. We're going to have our chance soon to put on the table whatever we can come up with. Right after the election, December 31st, we face what's known as the cliff. The cliff, at that point, many important pieces of legislation and laws will expire and automatic spending cuts will go in place. It's a pretty serious outcome. And this is our chance to come up with a bipartisan answer to it. We can't get to it until after the election, which I think uh, is understandable, such a highly charged political atmosphere until November 6. But after the election, it's really a test, a test of the House and Senate as to whether Democrats and Republicans can put the campaign behind them and work together to solve some of this nation's problems. The path that Simpson-Bowles laid out is a pretty direct one and a pretty obvious one. We need to do two things to reduce our deficit. We need more revenue, and we need to reduce spending. Those are the two things that reduce the deficit. I think we can do that. I think we can achieve that in a fair way. And I've tried to work and continue to work toward that goal. I would say that despite the statement of the Republican leader just a few minutes ago, I'm more hopeful 
even for the rest of this session. If we can put these filibusters behind us for a moment, if we can come to the floor and work together, I think we can achieve something. We did with the Farm Bill. We did with the Transportation Bill. We did with the Violence Against Women Act. And we did with postal reform. Bipartisan bills, important bills that passed the Senate, died in the House. And I hope if we show some leadership over here, the House will follow in a bipartisan fashion to deal with these same issues. We know that we have major problems facing us in this country, problems that won't be resolved unless we work together. Mr. President, I'd also like to, at this point, uh, at a separate place, with unanimous consent at a separate place in the record, I'd like to make a statement about another issue which I think relates directly to the performance of Congress and what's going on in American politics today. Across the street, the United States Supreme Court reached a decision known as Citizens United. It was a decision which had a dramatic impact on the way campaigns are waged in America. We've seen an unprecedented, unprecedented influence buying by corporations and individuals, wealthy individuals, in a way that we've never seen in the history of the United States. There are about 16 or 17 multimillionaires who are investing millions and millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, into our election process. Same thing holds true for major corporations. Let me tell you some of the numbers to compare. In the 2006 congressional midterm elections, outside groups spent $70 million to influence the result. 2006, $70 million. Four years later, 2010, outside groups raised the $70 million figure to $294 million, four times the amount that they spent in 2006. In the current presidential election cycle, outside special interest groups and wealthy individuals have already broken the record of 2010. These outside groups, and these aren't the campaigns of any candidates or even political parties, have already spent, with seven weeks to go, $350 million, breaking all records for outside money. How is this money being spent? Turn on your television in a battleground state and try to get around the television ads. They've spent $50 million more than they did in 2008, and we are just entering the end of this campaign, and the expenditures will skyrocket. If there was ever any doubt that the Citizens United decision would lead to a flood of campaign cash from wealthy individuals and corporations, we have our answer. At the end of 2010, there were 84 active super PACs. Two years later, there are now 657 super PACs prepared to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to persuade voters. Now, the only thing worse than this unprecedented amount of money from special interest groups and wealthy individuals flooding our airwaves is the fact that ordinary Americans often have no idea where this money's coming from. In 2006, only 1% of all outside spending came from secret donors. In 2010, after Citizens United and the rise of super PACs, secret donors rocketed to 46% of the outside spending on campaigns, which means when you see the ad on television, you have no idea, generally, in half the cases at least, who's paying for it. As I said before, these are not just super PACs. These are outside groups pouring money into elections. They're super secret PACs in many instances because the public has shockingly little information about the sources of the money. These super secret PACs and the wealthy individuals and corporations behind them are drowning out the voices of average citizens and many times the voices of the candidates themselves. Our representative democracy values transparency, participation in an open debate. Unfortunately, nonpartisan reports indicate that as the amount of money flooding into campaigns increases, core democratic principles are diminished. The little that we have been able to learn about the major donors to these super PACs is very disturbing. 17% of all funds raised by super PACs came from nonprofit businesses. It's safe to say, pardon me, for-profit businesses, it's safe to say that their primary goal is generally not advancing public interest, but rather enhancing their corporate bottom line. 
Eighty percent of funds given to super PACs during this presidential election, eighty percent of all the three hundred and fifty million dollars that I mentioned came from one hundred and ninety six people. One hundred and ninety six people who want to control our campaign process. Moreover, there's an ultra elite club of twenty two millionaires and billionaires that provided half of all super PAC money being spent in this presidential election. Twenty two Americans. I don't begrudge anyone their success in life or in business. I applaud it. The voices of business leaders, wealthy individuals, and spe special interests should be heard as part of the public debate. They're an important part of our country, and they need a seat at the policymaking table. Their voices, however, are not the only voices and opinions that matter. They should not occupy every seat at the policymaking table or by control of what's served on that table. A Las Vegas casino magnet, Sheldon Adelson, a billionaire oil tycoon, two brothers, Charles and David Koch, and the multi-millionaire head of a retail empire, Art Pope, may have achieved laudable business success, but their economic success does not entitle them to secretly use their virtually unlimited resources and impose their political will and their political agenda on America. Unfortunately, after the Citizens United case, that is exactly what they are trying to do. The Las Vegas casino magnate, Mr. Adelson, that is reportedly the most generous super PAC donor, has contributed $36 million and threatens to spend even more. His first bet was on a candidate named Newt Gingrich. And when he didn't make it to the finish line, Mr. Adelson said he's now going to give it to the Republican nominee for president. It's a lot of money and a lot of influence and probably more. But for this particular super PAC donor, that $36 million contribution, when you look at his wealth, is the equivalent to $168 from the average American. The terms of the political debate, and I fear the outcome of many elections, are not being set by 314 million Americans whose lives, jobs, safety, and health are impacted by the decisions of the people they elect. Instead, 22, 22 wealthy individuals pouring money into super PACs that have outsized influence on the terms of our political debate and the outcome of our elections. Our fellow Americans may not know the intricate details of campaign finance laws, but they know that their voices are being drowned out by these corporations, special interests, and wealthy individuals. And many people are losing confidence in this democracy as a result. According to a recent survey, three out of four Americans believe that corruption has increased over the last three years. Well, in some part, we can thank the Citizens United decision for that. The time to fix our broken campaign finance system is now. Now, Mr. President, I'm a realist. I understand that most Americans view this flood of spending by special interest groups and wealthy individuals on political campaigns the same way they view gangland slayings. Let them shoot one another as much as they want. As long as the bullets don't hit us, as long as we don't have to watch, let them have their, have their fun. But it's more serious than that. If our political process is stolen away from the average American, even the average candidate, by these special interest groups and wealthy individuals, it will diminish our democracy. There is no question. So here's an idea, one that I've been pushing for a long time. I introduced the Fair Elections Now Act, which would create a public financing system that would free candidates from the dangerous reliance on super PACs once and for all. Under fair elections, viable candidates who qualify for fair elections programs would raise campaign funds in small amounts from individual donors, small amounts. Once they've re raised a certain threshold number of small donations, they could receive matching funds and grants sufficient to run a competitive campaign. Fair elections would fundamentally reform our broken system and put the average citizens back in control of the, their elections and their country. I wonder what the American people would think of shorter campaigns directed to the issues, actual debates between the candidates. Would they miss us if they didn't see all those ads on television? I don't think they'd miss us. I also support the Disclose Act. You know, the Supreme Court got it wrong in Citizens United, but this bill 
that we've tried to pass would require super PACs and other big spenders to disclose all donors who give $10,000 or more to influence an election. What is wrong with transparency and disclosure when it comes to our democratic political process? I chair the Judiciary Committee's subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Human Rights. I would tell you that when it comes to constitutional amendments, I have been pretty picky as a member of the House and Senate. I think the Constitution, which I have sworn to uphold and defend as a member of the Senate and the House, is an extraordinary document. I am not so bold or big-headed to think that I've got a great idea that ought to be parked right in the middle of that fantastic and sacred document. And I've been skeptical of those who've offered amendments over the years. Uh, as I've said, I don't believe we should take a roller brush to a Rembrandt. It's an amazing work of political art, and we should take care not to amend it, except in the most extraordinary situations. During the most recent hearing, I chaired on the impact of Citizens United. Our subcommittee received 1,959,063 petition signatures from Americans representing every state in the Union, almost 2 million Americans. These Americans support a constitutional amendment that would stop the pernicious influence of secret corporate and special interest money. I see on the floor Senator Udall, Udall of New Mexico, who's been a leader on this issue, on this constitutional amendment. And as I've said, I'm very selective in the constitutional amendments that I'll add my name to. I've joined him because I think he's right. Citizens United has corrupted this political process. The likelihood that Congress can change it is a long shot. And if it's going to be changed, it needs to be changed in a meaningful way so that we can reclaim our political process for the people of this country and take it away from the 22 uh, multi-millionaires and billionaires who are trying to take control of this political process. I stand with these two million Americans, and I stand with Senator Udall and so many others, because the way we finance our campaigns in this country is in urgent need of reform. This will be the last day or two that the Senate meets before the elections. I wanted to come to the floor and speak to this issue before the election, whatever the outcome may be. America is not a better and stronger nation when we give up our political process to the wealthy and politically articulate. The strength of America is when every person has a voice and a vote, and they're not going to be overshadowed or outdistanced because of someone who happens to be very wealthy and very successful and wants to buy their way into our political system. Mr. President, I yield the floor. The Senator from New Mexico. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And let, let me just say before my uh, colleague, Senator Durbin, leads, leaves the floor that, that uh, this whole issue, as he has pointed out, of campaign finances is a, is a pressing issue. It's one that that is before us now and we're seeing it play out in the campaign and I'm sure at the end of this campaign that, that citizens across this country are going to demand reform, they're going to demand change. Uh, he's outlined several pieces of legislation here that I think really do that and this uh, constitutional amendment is one, the Disclose Act, a piece of legislation that, uh, that, that he has authored and fought for I think both in the House and in the Senate I think really bring transparency to the process, they bring disclosure to the process, and we need to do it. And so I really appreciate his leadership on this and look forward to working with him uh, very closely on this issue as we get into the next Congress. Thank you. Mr. President, uh, I, I uh, rise today to pay tribute to a gentleman by the name of Russell Train. On Monday of this week, our nation lost a great friend of the environment. I was saddened to learn of the passing of Russell Train. Russ was a true pioneer in the history of environmental protection. He was a part of that great generation of bipartisan leaders, that remarkable group of men and women, Democrats and Republicans, who put the environment center stage, who championed conservation. My father, who knew and admired Russ, was also a part of that generation. They leave very big shoes to fill. Their legacy is monumental. Russ Train's life parallels so much of the history of the environmental movement in this country. Because he was part of that history, because he did so much to make it happen. 
1965, when he was 45, Russ left his position as U.S. tax court judge. He decided to devote himself full-time to conservation and became president of the Conservation Foundation. His midlife career change may have been a loss for the tax court, but it was a huge gain for the environment. Brilliant, tenacious, committed, he dedicated the rest of his life to the environment. Along with Rachel Carson, the celebrated author of Silent Spring, Russ helped raise environmental issues to the national level. He served as Under Secretary of Interior from 1969 to 1970. He was the first chairman of the White House Council on Environmental Quality from 1970 to 1973. He was instrumental in the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency and headed it from 1973 to 1977. During those years, he oversaw landmark legislation, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Toxic Substance Control Act, all bore the imprint of Russell Train. Perhaps his most lasting achievement was the National Environmental Policy Act in 1970. He helped see that groundbreaking legislation through the Nixon White House and through Congress. For over 40 years now, NEPA has required federal agencies to prepare environmental impact statements for any major projects. NEPA is justly regarded as the foundation for U.S. environmental protections. But what began as a bipartisan triumph was later subject to partisan divide. While in the House in 2005, I served as the ranking member of a task force whose stated purpose was to review and improve NEPA, but there were those who wanted to destroy it. With one swift blow or by a thousand cuts, but destroy it all the same. Many of us fought very hard not to let that happen. As I said at that time, where critics of NEPA saw only delay, we saw deliberation. Where they saw postponed profits, we saw public input. NEPA was then and is now an antidote to the potential arrogance of government power. It listens to the community. It addresses opposition early on. And in the long run, minimizes conflict and protects the environment. It trusts the American people to take part in managing their public resources. And it remains one of Russell Train's greatest legacies. Russ himself stated it best at the 40th anniversary of NEPA. He said then that NEPA is America's most imitated environmental legislation around the globe. What we launched in 1970 has become a contribution to the planet, not less than to our citizenry. NEPA's legacy is that what the people know has great value to a government that seeks their knowledge and takes it seriously. After leaving the government, Russell led the U.S. branch of the World Wildlife Fund for many years. And he did so with his usual passion and commitment always engaged, always pragmatic and reasonable, but ever the visionary for a better world. In 1991, President Bush awarded Russ the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Russell Train was a remarkable man. Jill and I have been honored to call him and his wonderful wife, Aline, our friends. We extend our sincere condolences to Aline and their children and hope that they will take comfort in knowing that the world is a better place for Russell's life and work. And um, I understand that uh, Senator uh, Paul was going to speak, but um, if I don't see him here this moment, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and start. I, I have several other co uh, comments on a subject, uh, uh, and I would ask that they be at a separate place in the record. Without objection. On January 16th, um, President Taft signed the proclamation making New Mexico the 47th state. And so it is with great pride that I join Senator Bingaman in introducing this resolution, recognizing the centennial anniversary of our state. For those of us who are blessed to call New Mexico home, we are imprinted by its remarkable history and its awesome beauty. And we are part of the rich diversity of its people. 
100 years ago, the population of New Mexico was 327,000 people. Now it's over 2 million. But the mix of Native American, Hispanic, and European traditions had long been a part of our state. New Mexico is a land of deep roots, and we are enriched by this mosaic of culture. It, is info it has informed our history, our art, and our sense of who we are as a people. Our state is rightly called the land of enchantment. It is also a land of courage, from the Civil War to Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders, from the Navajo Code Talkers to Bataan and Corriador, from Korea and Vietnam to the brave men and women who have served in Iraq and Af Afghanistan. When our, when our nation is called, New Mexico has always stood ready to answer that call. The story of New Mexico is a long and proud one. It goes back well over 10,000 years to the Clovis people. It goes back to Santa Fe, founded in 1610, the oldest capital city in the United States. In 1920, Route 66 connected New Mexico to California and to the Midwest. This and other interstate projects that followed brought jobs and more people to our state. And today we need a new commitment to investing in the infrastructure that is essential to renewed prosperity. In the 20s and 30s, New Mexico was a part of an oil boom that fueled the rest of the nation. And today we are on the cutting edge of clean energy technology, helping to reduce our nation's dependence on foreign oil. And in the 40s and 50s, Sandia and Los Alamos National Labs became legendary centers of scientific innovation and research. Today, they continue to play a vital role in our nation's security, and also our state is promoting STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math, so that our graduates can get good jobs, so that they can compete in a global economy. How we address these issues will shape the next 100 years in our state. But I'm sure of one thing, we have a blend of cultures and backgrounds like nowhere else. It has helped bring us where we are today. It will help take us where we need to go tomorrow. The vitality and creativity of our people is as strong as ever. Working together, we will continue to meet the challenges of our state and our nation. In this year of our centennial, we look back to our unique history and we look forward to a bright future. And I thank the, uh, I thank the Senator, uh, Senator Paul for, for allowing me to uh, finish my statement. Uh, uh, appreciate very much your courtesies. And with that, I yield the floor. Senator from Kentucky. I'm going to tell you the story today of a love affair. It's a story that's a steamy one. It's a story of illicit behavior, of treachery, and of gluttony. It's a story that involves intrigue and deception. It's a story of unintended consequences, and it's a story of anger and violence. It is the story of American foreign aid. Joseph Sambai Mukendi never sleeps at home anymore. Mukendi's sleep is interrupted by dreams. He feels unsafe, even a continent away from his attackers. Mukendi was arrested at home one night. He was taken to an underground cell at Camp Congolo, a military base in Kinshasa, Zaire. The secret police of Mobutu stripped him naked stretched him out on the floor. Then he was beaten with a large stick with nails protruding from the end. Mobutu received billions of dollars in foreign aid from our country. Over his 30-year bloody dictatorship, he received billions of your dollars. As his people starved, his wife went to Europe, spent millions of dollars on spending sprees. Zaire has very little running water and sporadic electricity. It rotted under Mobutu's rule, and yet he received billions of American dollars. Mobutu stole the lion's share of this. He became one of the richest men in the world. Enough was stolen that his wealth was estimated to be in the billions. They called his wife Gucci Mobutu. 
Her shoe collection rivaled Imelda Marcos. She was capable of spending a million dollars in one day in Europe. John Nguzu Carly Bond was an ally of Mobutu who fell out of his favor. Mobutu accused him of trying to seduce the First Lady. Many believe that his only crime was that he was mentioned in the, for in the foreign press as a possible successor to Mobutu. Nguzu was subjected to physical and electric, electric torture to the genitals, too horrific to even repeat. The administration of Jimmy Carter, who ostensibly were champions of human rights, nevertheless continued the steady flow of foreign aid. For foreign aid is a bipartisan project. There's a consensus in the United States and in the Senate, we must send it no matter what the behavior of the recipients. Not only did our leaders turn a blind eye to Mobutu's graft and human rights abuses, they bestowed upon him inexplicable personal friendship. Mobutu was known as a personal friend of the first President Bush, and vacationed at his personal residence. When Mobutu traveled to Europe, he would stop by the central bank of Zaire. Early in his reign, he would come by with a Louis Vuitton bag and he would get about $50,000 in cash. Towards the end of his career, he was getting $500,000 in cash for these trips to Europe. One of his many foreign residences was in Switzerland. He apparently had the time and money to vacation there and even had his own brandy being made at your expense. It's sad to contemplate what despots and dictators have done and are doing to their people. It's sadder still to realize that they are being subsidized in this horrific behavior by your money. And it continues. We're having a debate now over foreign aid because they still want to send more. Many people think the answer is to send more. Maybe they'll behave better if they get more of your money. Apologists for foreign aid don't deny that foreign aid has often been stolen by corrupt leaders. And there's evidence that the humanitarian uh, outcomes are scant and don't occur. Nevertheless, the advocates of foreign aid justify the continuing aid with the argument that we must often choose the lesser of two evils. As many have pointed out, the lesser of two evils is still evil. Throughout the Cold War, the perceived threat of Soviet expansionism, though clouded the mind thought of many leaders. American leaders would pick one dictator over another if he were or she were a pro-American dictator. We didn't care what he was doing to his people. We turned a blind eye. We gave money from dictators from Saddam Hussein, who was once our ally, receiving billions of your dollars, to the Mujahideen, who were radical jihadists, but at the time we didn't mind if you were a radical jihadist, if you were our radical jihadist, because they were opposing the Soviet Union. But the Mujahideen actually eventually became the Taliban, who are now our enemies. We despise jihad now, and we fight against radical Islamic jihad, but at one time, we subsidized jihad. In fact, there were several weapons left over from the time period when we were giving weapons to the Mujahideen. We subsidized Gaddafi before we fought Gaddafi. We gave Gaddafi four and eight. He was our friend. In the year preceding his overthrow, there were senators from this body speaking with Gaddafi's family about sending more money to Gaddafi. Where does the insanity end? U.S. foreign aid has continued to flow despite a long string of abuses well known to most of those who are dispensing the aid. They simply turn a blind eye. Except for Libya, Egypt, and Tunisia, where many are saying, let's send the money to secularists, now there's a question of whether some of that money may be going to radical Islamists. With the end of the Cold War, some were finally cut off. Mobutu, who I mentioned, who committed these atrocious uh, aspects of torture, finally was cut off. But after 30 years of receiving your money, torturing his own people, and stealing everyone blind, foreign aid from developed countries in 2006 totaled $100 billion a year. Over the past 50 years, we've given $2 trillion to developed countries in foreign aid. 
Over the past 42 years, Easterly states that 568 billion that has flowed to Africa, that the, the per capita growth in income in Africa has been flat. In fact, some countries, like Zimbabwe, where Mugabe was in charge for several decades, the growth rate has actually been negative. So those who say, oh, I just simply want to help people, I want to help poor people around the world by sending them money, it is stolen by their leaders, doesn't get to the poor people, and besides, you may have heard, we're a trillion dollars short in our budget here. How are we sending money overseas? Some academics have argued that with the Arab Spring, the emerging democracies will require even more foreign aid. Hillary Clinton is here on Capitol Hill today asking for more money to go to Egypt. As they burn our flag, as the hordes gather by the tens of thousands, she's asking to send Egypt more money. There were no Egyptian policemen or soldiers that showed up when our embassy was attacked, and Hillary Clinton is asking for more money to go to Egypt. According to Coyne and Ryan, the world's worst dictators have received $105 billion under the guise of official developmental assistance. Instead of helping the poor, the assistance is aiding the ability of the dictators to remain in power. In fact, it keeps them in power long enough that it inflames the populace that we end up having to go back in because of war because the populace is so inflamed against a dictator that we've propped up against popular rule. Some academics argue that emerging democracies will require more aid. Professors Bruce Bueno de Mesquita and Alistair Smith argue that democracy will make the price much higher. Democracy in Egypt comes at a big price for U.S. voters. Good or bad, that is up to the observer, but it will be costly, no doubt. The professor's argument is that democracy is messy and costs more to subsidize because the ballot box gives voice to the minorities that dictators would not hear, that they would silence or imprison. I think the real question and the image that you have to have in your mind is when you see 10,000 people outside the embassy in Pakistan burning the U.S. flag, can you imagine that we would send them more money? Can you imagine that we would not ask for restrictions on this money? I've been asking for six weeks to place restrictions on foreign aid. I'm not even asking to end it, although I would. I'm asking simply to place restrictions on it. And you watch this vote. If I get this vote, you watch. The vast majority of the Senate is going to vote for unlimited, unrestricted foreign aid. I will probably lose this vote. But if you ask your friends, if you go home and you ask your friends, should we be sending money to countries that disrespect us, to countries that burn our flag? I think you'll find that 80 to 90 percent of the American people wouldn't send another penny. But that may also be why Congress has about a 10 percent approval rating. They don't get it. Ninety percent of the folks up here are going to vote to continue sending your money with no restrictions to countries that burn your flag and disrespect you. Is it any wonder that only 10 percent of America approves of Congress? In fact, many people claim to be conservatives are for foreign aid. Big government conservative advocates such as John Guardiano try to couch their support in feigned opposition. He says, now I don't like foreign aid any more than the next conservative. Most foreign aid is probably economically wasteful and counterproductive, but the point of foreign aid is not economics, it's geopolitics. And that's what most of them will admit around here. It is intended to shape a recipient country's behavior and quite literally buy American influence. And to his mind, he says it does that. But if foreign aid is meant to shape the country's behavior, advocates have a lot of explaining to do. From Mobutu to Mugabe, from Mubarak to Hussein, from Hussein to Gaddafi, to the current Egypt, to the current Pakistan that is holding a gentleman who helped us get bin Laden, to the current Pakistan that seemed somehow to let bin Laden live for seven years in their midst with no knowledge that he was there. They have some explaining to do. And those who advocate foreign aid saying it's shaping the behavior of these countries, they have some explaining to do because it doesn't appear as if these countries 
respect America. It doesn't appear as if they even like us. And it also doesn't appear that if they want to be our allies, that they're acting like it. That's all I'm asking, that if you want to be an ally of our country, act like it. And if you want to receive in cash an American check, you need to act like our ally at the very least. There's some question about whether the aid works when it's sent for poverty or humanitarian purposes. Doug Bandow asked this question and argues that foreign aid actually encourages poverty and starvation because African nations use displays of poverty and starvation to seek more aid. Why get rid of your problem? Why cure your problem if that's what you're showing the world you have so you can get more aid? We don't seem to care about results because we continue to give it to some of these dictators for decades who produce no results and we know we're stealing the money. Vrodegram and Knack illustrate the existence of a moral hazard problem surrounding foreign aid. They contend that aid allocation may actually encourage impoverishing policy because as the damaging policies create misery, the more likely the donors are to grant more aid. Herb Worland maintains that American foreign aid is undermined by tariffs and subsidies, including a $3 billion a year subsidy lavished on 25,000 cotton farmers. Because of high subsidies, America is able to export corn at two-thirds of the cost of production, making it impossible for African farmers to compete. So our trade policy makes it harder for African countries to become self-sufficient. Peanuts are protected by a tariff up to 164 percent, thereby making Africa's peanut-producing nations, such as Uganda, even more dependent on aid. But it's not just rich people in poor countries getting foreign aid. We also continue to ship your dollars to rich countries. Michael Tennant reports, According to a report from the Congressional Research Service, in fiscal year 2010, the United States' top creditor nations received millions of dollars in aid. So the countries we're borrowing money from, we're sending them foreign aid. China, to whom we owe over a trillion dollars, still gets $27 million in aid. Russia, who we owe $127 billion, still gets $71 million in aid. To add insult to injury, China gets economic development assistance from the United States taxpayer. It just amazes me. But you mark my words, you listen to the debate, and you watch the vote today, the vast majority don't want any change to foreign aid other than that they would increase it. If we're not getting the behavior we want, they would increase it. Hillary Clinton is on Capitol Hill today asking to increase aid to Egypt. Not to put restrictions on the aid, to increase it. We currently do have some restrictions on aid to Egypt. Hillary Clinton has waived those and said they're doing fine. When the marauders, when the horde came to the embassy in Egypt last week, there was a phone call made to our embassy saying the mob's coming, but no soldiers came. No one came to protect our embassy. In the civilized world, protecting a nation, the host nation, protecting the guest nation's embassy is of primary concern. It is something that every nation, every civilized nation is expected to do. In the case of Egypt, no one came. We were lucky that we escaped death in Egypt. We weren't so lucky in Libya. The report on China that found out that we were borrowing money and then giving, it, giving foreign aid to countries that we borrow from was commissioned by Senator Tom Coburn, who's been watching out for your money. He demanded this report, and he said, borrowing money from countries who receive our aid is dangerous for both the donor and the recipient. If countries can afford to buy our debt, perhaps they can afford to fund their own assistance programs without relying on the American taxpayer. Michael Tennant goes on to say that we give China $3.9 million to enforce the rule of law and human rights, neither of which are thought to be China's selling points. The one that really burns, though, is that $700,000 in economic development assistance. It just boggles my mind that the U.S. taxpayers asked to send money to China, who's out-competing us, 
in virtually every sector for us to send money to subsidize their economic development assistance? One would think that with all this evidence that foreign aid would not reach the intent, that it doesn't reach the intended beneficiaries and often winds up in the hands of dictators, you would think that this information would make it easy to defeat foreign aid. When you look at the polls of the American people, you find that nearly 80% of the American people think foreign aid in general is a bad idea. We have roads in our country that are crumbling and need repair. We have bridges that are crumbling. In my state alone, we had a bridge out six months last year. We have two bridges that are older than I am and need to be replaced in Kentucky. We don't have the money, but we somehow have billions of dollars to send to people who disrespect us and burn our flag. I don't understand how we can send our money to these countries who disdain us, who disrespect us. In Pakistan, they hold a doctor who helped us get bin Laden. We fought a 10-year war in Afghanistan to get bin Laden and his followers. We finally got him. No help to Pakistan or no help from Pakistan. He lived in Pakistan for many years. Pakistan's now mad that we got him. In fact, they riot over there and burn the American flag because we killed bin Laden. What do we do? Here's some more money. If we give you some more money, will you behave? If you give you some more money, will you let our supplies go across your northern frontier? But we don't ask them the real question. Are you our friend? If you're our friend, act like it. If you're our ally, act like it. Anytime this question is broached over foreign aid, the vast majority of career politicians complain bitterly and quash any debate. I've been trying to have this vote for six weeks. I'm still hopeful that we'll get it, but they don't want to vote on this because they know that they're voting against the popular will. They're voting against the wishes of their constituents. There's not one senator from any one of the 50 states up here that when they vote against these limitations on foreign aid, that won't be voting against the will of their state. They won't be getting, voting against the will of their people. You can go to Massachusetts or Maine or to conservative Texas and ask the taxpayers, ask the voters, are you in favor of sending money to these countries where tens of thousands of people are gathering and burning our flag? Are you in favor of sending hard-earned taxpayer money to countries that disrespect us? Are you in favor of sending money to these countries when we have so many problems at home that we can't handle? And you'll find in every state in the union, you'll find a majority of the voters, sometimes a vast majority of the voters, think it's a mistake. So what's happening here is that the will of the people is not being transmitted to this body. Because this body, when it votes on this issue, will vote in direct defiance to the will of the people. It's often said that it's difficult to determine whether a recipient is a friend or a foe. Libya is an example. One day, Libya came in from the cold. A long-time pariah among nations, rivaling Iran as a model for extreme thuggishness, Libya came in from the cold. Libya and her Colonel Qaddafi phoned the West and said they would change their ways. They would stop developing weapons of mass destruction and become good neighbors to all. This is before the recent Libyan revolution. This is the Gaddafi that we helped to overturn that was, by all accounts, a horrible dictator. But about two or three years ago, he came in from the cold and wanted to be a friend to America because he wanted our assistance. With an alacricity sped by naivete, the West welcomed Gaddafi back into the bosom of respected nations. Delegations of U.S. senators, ones who are still in this body, went to meet with Gaddafi, to meet with Gaddafi's family, to offer Gaddafi money. Prime Minister Tony Blair gushed with praise for his new friend, Colonel Gaddafi. President Bush concluded that Libya was no longer a sponsor of terror. Three senators met with Gaddafi's son and, accorded to him, and according to leaked cables, offered him aid. Fast forward barely a year later into the Arab Spring, and these same senators who were offering Qaddafi aid were back in Libya offering the rebels aid. 
we should scratch our head and say, my goodness, maybe we should question the judgment of these people who tell you foreign aid should be given to everyone all the time, and if they misbehave, give them more. Because you have senators from this body going and offering aid to Gaddafi, and a year later offering it to the rebels to overthrow Gaddafi, and saying Gaddafi is a terrible dictator. He was. He always was. But he played a game, and we accepted the game because we're always willing to play the game with your money. Egypt. Egypt is a, a pile of contradictions. In the words of former CIA agent Robert Baer, if you want a serious interrogation, you send a prisoner to Jordan. If you want them tortured, you send them to Syria. But if you want them to disappear, to never see them again, you send them to Egypt. Now this was the Egypt under Mubarak, who when we felt someone needed to be tortured or disappeared and we didn't want there to be any repercussions coming back on us, that's where they sent them, to Egypt. Over the past 30 years, we bought this sort of regime there to do our bidding when we wished. It became very unpopular with the people. And so you wonder about the Arab Spring, and you wonder, why are these people so unhappy? Well, they hated Mubarak because he was a dictator. He was an autocrat, and they didn't have freedom of speech. They didn't have freedom of association, and they were beaten with billy clubs if they tried to gather. Their political parties were outlawed. They hated Mubarak because he was an anti-democrat. He didn't allow voting. But he was our guy. We paid for him. So you have to think this through. Why is there such a widespread anti-Americanism? Because we propped up and gave money to so many despots, to so many dictators. Over the past 30 years, the United States sent over $30 billion to Egypt to help finance a police state ruled by an emergency, emergency decree that lasted several decades. Khalid Saeed became the face of that foreign aid as pictures of his bloody beating at the hands of the Egyptian police spurred the youth of Egypt to take to the streets in the Arab Spring of 2011. On June 6, 2010, Saeed had been sitting on the second floor of a cyber cafe. Two detectives from the Sidi Gaber police station entered the premises and arrested him. Multiple witnesses testified that Saeed was beaten to death by the police who reportedly hit him and smashed him against objects as he was led outside to their police car. The owner of the internet cafe in which Saeed was arrested stated that he witnessed Saeed being beaten to death in the doorway of the building across the street. And after the detectives took him out of the cafe at the owner's request, another young man, Wail Gonim, a young Egyptian living in Dubai, found the photos of Saeed after he was beaten to death by police and he started a Facebook page. It was called, We Are All Khalid Saeed. It was moderated by Wail Gonim. It brought attention to his death and it became a phenomenon. And it spread across the Middle East as people saw the death of this man beaten to death by the police. So we have to think, why are we seeing people burning the American flag? Why are we seeing such great unrest in 30 different countries? Because our foreign aid, and our military aid has propped up dictators who become over decades despotic, autocratic, who torture their people, prevent freedom from occurring, and then there's a backlash. What we're seeing is the backlash of 30 years of foreign aid and propping up military dictatorships simply because they were predisposed to like us as opposed to someone else. We are all Khalid Saeed, was the rallying cry that brought hundreds of thousands of people to the street in Egypt. Gonim's Facebook, where he posted, We are all Khalid Saeed, spawned a revolution. As hundreds of thousands of protesters filled Tahir Square, the police beat them back. David Reif of the New Republic reports, U.S. military aid to Egypt, which, average one, which averages $1.3 billion annually, allowed the Egyptian police and paramilitaries to bombard protesters with volley after volley of tear gas made by a company 
in Pennsylvania. Why are they angry? They know this. They know that their protests are beaten down by autocrats supported by the U.S. who are spraying tear gas on them made in the United States. We have to understand the dynamic if we're ever to try to improve the situation. The protests in Egypt escalated day after day. An unemployed man by the name of Salah Mahmoud, who had moved to Cairo in search of work to save enough money to own a home and marry, but instead had been living on small days' wages, set himself on fire in the middle of the street before being put out by bystanders. The U.S. military aid and tactical training given to Libya, Egypt, and Tunisia to fight terrorism was used to fight against free association and freedom of speech of their people. When we hear about the Arab Spring, we need to understand where did the Arab Spring come from? The Arab Spring was a rising up for democracy. There's nothing wrong with that. But why would a rising up for democracy, why would that take on anti-American tones? I'm as offended as, offended as anybody else by the people burning our flag but you have to understand, why did the Arab Spring, that seemed to be a search for freedom and democracy, why did it get transformed into an Arab winter? Why did it get transformed into an anti-American protest? Because the tear gas that rained down on them for decades was made here. Because the police batons were paid for with your money. Because Mubarak, who stole billions of dollars and whose family lived with such wealth in abundance with homes in London and Paris and secret Swiss accounts, he got that at your expense. So when they hated Mubarak, they hated you also. They hated us because we were Mubarak. They hated us because we were Ben Ali in Tunisia. They hated us because we were at one time Saddam Hussein's friend. If we don't understand this, we're never going to figure out a way to make things better. There are many and ample fiscal reasons to oppose foreign aid, but Thomas Edlam puts it succinctly when he writes, foreign aid has historically been used to suppress freedom and has reduced the moral influence of the example of the U.S. Constitution. See, it's hard for us to imagine, because we have such a great Constitution and such great freedom here, why don't they appreciate that? Why don't they appreciate and look to the shining example that we set? And we do set a great example in our country for freedom and tolerance and association. Why can't the folks in the Middle East see that? Because they see the truncheon. They see the police baton. They see the jail cells. They see trial without jury from the autocrats that we have supported. You have to understand why this anti-Americanism comes. It has come because largely our foreign aid for decade upon decade has been given to despots throughout the Middle East. Those despots have run roughshod on their people and their people are unhappy. It's not that they despise our Constitution. I think many of them would like to have the freedoms enshrined in our Constitution. But it's confusing to us because we think, oh, they hate what America is all about. They hate America for our wealth and freedom. They don't hate wealth and freedom. They really probably don't hate us in the abstract. But they hate us because when they see Mubarak, when they see the other end of a truncheon coming from the police of Mubarak or the police of Saddam Hussein, or the chemical weaponry and the chemical gas that Hussein sprayed on his people, they see where it came from, and they see the money that came in to prop up these dictators. From 1980 to 1988, there was a war. We've largely forgotten about it. It was between Iran and Iraq. In that war, there were planes on both sides, American planes, because we'd sold planes to both sides. At the time, Iran was still flying many F-4s, a couple hundred F-4 Phantoms, and on the other side, we had advisors on the ground advising Hussein. Hussein was our ally, and we sent money to Hussein on a routine basis. 
There are some reports that say Hussein directly got money from our CIA. So you can understand the confusion over there. And you can understand that even though Iraq has been liberated and there is a democracy there, that some of them still seem to hate us for some reason. You wonder why would they hate us if we freed them? Because some of them still remember Hussein and they, they fear there'll be another Hussein. One of the saddest stories that came up, I think, in the last week was a young soldier was killed in Afghanistan. He was killed by the policeman, the Afghan policeman that he was training. We've had over 50 deaths in Afghanistan this year from friendly fire from our supposed allies. This one was particularly sad. This boy was to come home within a week or two. His brother was having a football game. He was supposed to make his brother's football game. This is a patriotic family. This is a military family. This boy proudly served and he deserves nothing but our admiration. But he called his dad a week before and he said to his dad, I think the guy that I'm training is going to kill me. The Afghan policeman had been coming up to him for weeks saying, we don't want you here. These are the people we're sending our money to and that we're sending our boys to die, our young men and women to die over there. But we're supporting people who it isn't clear that they are our friends. It isn't clear that they want to be our allies. And it isn't clear that we can buy their friendship. The president of Afghanistan, Karzai, we basically helped get in power. He stays in power probably because of our presence there. And yet he's disdainful of us. They have said, oh, if there's a war with Pakistan, Karzai said he would side with Pakistan. When there was a shooting recently where a Afghan policeman shot several of our officers in a government building where they shouldn't have been armed or weren't armed, Karzai's response was to talk about the burning of the Koran as if there was justification for these deaths. When the riots erupted in Egypt recently, what were the first words out of President Morsi's mouth from Egypt? The first words out of his mouth was, how dare America produce this film? Well, America didn't produce this film, but those were the first words out of his mouth. Not that we should protect the embassy and that really you're, there is no justification for attacking an embassy regardless of any kind of discussion over this movie. But we have to figure out how do we get and retain valid allies. We do have allies around the world we don't give any money to. But too often, through the years, we have decided to choose one dictator over another, to choose the lesser of two evils. Ultimately, often, we've had to go back in to fight against our own weapons. Hussein was our ally. We ended up going back in to fight against him. The Mujahideen that became the Taliban, they were our ally, too, against Russia. We were, in fact, explicitly in favor of radical jihad when it was directed against the Soviet Union. Some of the weapons are left over. In fact, when you look at Taliban weapons captured now, many of them are American weapons because it's unclear whether or not we have a good handle on what we give to the Afghan police. We're not positive that they don't wind up in the hands of the Taliban. It's a very murky situation. But I don't think it's a situation that should continue. I think it's time to come home from Afghanistan. Now, people say, on the other side, they say, oh, you want to disengage. No, I want to have relationships with countries around the world. I want to have diplomatic relationships. I want to have trade. But I don't think having diplomatic relationships or engaging with other countries means you have to bribe them. I think there are some people who hate you enough that bribing them won't work and often is counterproductive. Thomas Edlam reports that even Reif from the New Republic, who's not an opponent of foreign aid, in theory, concluded a foreign aid to Egypt that this is not only a moral scandal, it is a geopolitical strategic blunder of huge proportions. Like so many authoritarian regimes, the prime beneficiary of the U.S. foreign aid to Egypt was the leader for life, Mubarak. And the end result of 30 years of supporting an unpopular dictator is that we're now seeing uprising in the streets. Why are they anti-American? Because they see us as friends of Mubarak. Mubarak was not a friend of freedom. 
Aladdin Alassar is the author of The Last Pharaoh, Mubarak and the Uncertain Future of Egypt in the Obama Age. He said that the Mubaraks owned several residences in Egypt, some inherited from previous presidents and the monarchy, and others he has built. He has had a very lavish lifestyle with many homes around the country. He estimates their family's wealth to be between 50 and 70 billion dollars. The gross national income is $2,000 per family in Egypt. You think that might make people a little bit mad? Guys worth 50 to 70 billion dollars and the average income is $2,000? The average income in Africa hasn't improved in decades and you've got dictators worth billion dollars. Do you think it makes those people harbor anti-American sentiment because the leaders, these dictators, have gotten American money? About 20% of the population in Egypt lives below the poverty line, according to a, a 2010 report. And it's not just Mubarak himself. It's his whole family that's been enriched. In 2001, they estimated his wealth at $10 billion just in American banks, Swiss, British banks, Bank of Scotland, Bank of England, Credit Suisse of Switzerland. You wonder what it's worth today or if we've found it all. You also wonder how much of that money in those secret bank accounts is really just your money. Egypt's first lady, Suzanne Mubarak's wealth, just by herself is estimated at $5 billion. How much of that is your money? When you hear these numbers of billions of dollars that dictators have secreted away in Swiss bank accounts, listen to that and remember when you hear the plethora of senators who will come to the floor and say that not one penny of foreign aid should ever be cut, ever. Not one penny of aid, they argue, should have conditions placed on it. The amendment that I will offer today places conditions on foreign aid. But it places conditions that have to pass the Senate, not that can be rubber stamped by Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton thinks human rights are going fine in Egypt. She rubber stamped and said, give them a billion a couple of months ago. No human rights ab abuses in Egypt. She also approved an extra billion for Pakistan a month ago. We can't rely on the purse strings to be transferred particularly to this administration, but even to any administration, Republican or Democrat. The purse strings are to remain, were intended to remain, and the Constitution says are to remain in the legislature. This is a real problem. So my legislation makes it come back, and we have to vote on it here, that they are in compliance, that there are no human rights violations, that Egypt's not stealing the money, and that they're willing and able that they can and will protect our embassy. I think at a very minimum, if you're going to cash our check, if you're going to have our foreign aid, which I'm not a big fan of, but if you're going to give it, at the very least, it should have strings attached that say, you have to protect the American embassy. One of Mubarak's sons was Jamal Mubarak. He's the Assistant Secretary General of the ruling National Democratic Party in Egypt. His own wealth is estimated at $17 billion, supposedly spread through several banking institutions in Switzerland, Germany, and the U.S., and Britain. You wonder, how much of the $17 billion is really your money? Allah Mubarak's a daughter. Her property has reached into the uh, nearly $8 billion, She's got properties on Rodeo Drive in Los Angeles, real estate in Washington State, New York, owns two royal yachts with the value of six million pounds. These are the yachts you can land a helicopter on. These are the yachts that have a swimming pool on. How much of that eight billion dollars, how much of the money that went to pay for these yachts for the Mubarak family is yours? See, you now the thing is, is you should be mad. And I think Americans are mad, but it's this confusing situation. We should be mad about the foreign aid, and so are the populations that are burning the American flag are mad. Because, see, they didn't receive the foreign aid. The foreign aid went to Mubarak. 
So you should be mad that your senators send this money to dictators and that the dictators live these lavish lifestyles and live in these mansions around the world throughout Switzerland, London, Paris. Some of the largest private homes in the world are owned by dictators paid for with your money. You should be angry. You should be frothing. You should be upset. And you should tell your senators, you should tell your congressmen, no more money to these dictators. But at the same time you become angry, think it through and understand why the Arab world is angry. They don't hate our freedom. They don't hate our Constitution. They are angry at their own dictators, but they are angry that we propped up their dictators for decades after decades. But it all has to do with foreign aid. I've been arguing primarily about Pakistan, but the thing is, is this is bigger than Pakistan. Pakistan's just the most egregious and one of the larger recipients of our aid. Three billion dollars worth a year, maybe more. And right now they're holding Dr. Shaquille Afridi, who's a doctor who helped us get bin Laden. They tortured him for a year and he's been in prison for the rest of his life. That's not the way an ally acts. I say no more money. I don't think that's too harsh. No more money to Pakistan until they release this doctor. I don't think that's too much to ask, but you'll find very few in this body. Ask the American people. 80 to 90 percent agree with me. No more money to Pakistan until this doctor is free. Ask this body. About 10 percent. I'll be lucky to get 20 percent of them to agree to have not just cut off aid, have restrictions on aid. That's how bad it is. The Arab Spring brought corruption and theft of USAID to light in Libya and Egypt. But Africa is rife with stories of theft and dictator spoils. Teodoran Obiang Nugema is the son of Equatorial Guinea's dictator. He, ran, he recently ran afoul of French customs who discovered that his charter jet had 26 supercars on it, including seven Ferraris, five Bentleys, four Rolls Royces, and two Bugattis. Is anybody besides me mad that we are sending foreign aid to African dictators whose sons are importing Rolls Royces, Bentleys, Ferraris, and Bugattis to Africa to countries that have no electricity? I don't care if you're the biggest humanitarian in the world, you want to help people, it's not going to the people. The foreign aid is stolen by the leadership of these countries, and this isn't one example. This is example after example, decade after decade, and the learning curve around here is so slow that we will get 10, maybe 20 senators to place any restrictions on foreign aid. 70% of the people living in Africa live under the poverty threshold, $2 a day. Two dollars a day, and the son of a leader is importing Bugattis, Bentleys, Rolls Royces, Ferraris on his own private charter jet. It's got to be a pretty big jet to have 26 supercars on it. And the rest of Africa lives on two dollars a day. It's your money stolen or given by your government to dictators in Africa. You have to get the connection. You need to be bad. There needs to be an American spring. An American spring where you tell your leaders you're sick and tired of your money going to fund dictators. An American spring where we understand what happened in the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring is a direct consequence of us sending foreign aid and lavishing it on people who don't respect the freedom of their constituents, who don't allow constitutional freedoms. The Arab Spring's anger, as much as it is directed against America, is not against our Constitution. It isn't because they don't believe in freedom. It's because they're upset that we've been funding and subsidizing their dictators. The U.S. has given Guinea almost $300 million over the past 10 years, despite Guinea having one of the worst human rights records on the planet. Torture is said to be commonplace. The New York Times reported that last spring, any policeman can arrest any citizen at any time. Torture is a current thing. 
a current thing, said Mr. Miko, a lawyer who is an opposition party, recalling his own beating in the presence of high officials. Gonzalo Nadong Sima, a pharmacist in the center of town here, recounted his recent encounter with police over a simple traffic mishap. They beat me like an animal. So what do we do? We give Guinea your money and the people who are beaten with police truncheons at traffic accidents, who are they mad at? We need to begin to understand where the anger is coming from. When you prop up dictators in third world countries who beat their subjects into submission, that's why they're angry. They don't care that we're wealthy or free. They're angry because we prop up dictators who beat them with truncheons. Despite widespread reports of abuse, corruption and ineffectiveness, foreign aid continues unabated. Despite polls that show over 70% of the American voters are opposed to foreign aid, it continues unabated. Even when advocates of foreign aid are beaten down with stories such as I've been telling today of human rights abuses, starvation, and downright death threats, hangings, shootings, executions, these advocates trot forward their last defense. But foreign aid is only 1% of the budget. It's only $30 billion. You know how many times they use that argument? Every time I want to cut $30 billion. It's only $30 billion. They use it for $300 million too. It's only $300 million. If you don't get started somewhere, how are you going to ever balance your budget? We can't live on with trillion dollar deficits. They argue eliminating foreign aid won't balance the budget. No, it won't, but it's a start. And you have to start somewhere. And why not start with something that's counterproductive? Why not start with eliminating something from the budget that is counterproductive and seems to create some of the anger, at least is some explanation for the anger in the Arab world? The final arguments for foreign aid are so flimsy as you would not think they would be worth much to even try to refute. Proponents of the status quo use this argument over and over again for any budgetary item. But if we can't cut millions now, or even billions, how will we ever get to trillions? When conservatives have argued for cutting small subsidies to little airports that sometimes subsidize one airline ticket by $3,000, they argue it'll only save 300 million. It's not a valid argument. It's a weak argument. We shouldn't accept it. Cutting 30 billion dollars worth of foreign aid wouldn't balance the budget. But you know, I'm not even asking to cut the foreign aid. What I'm asking is that we place contingencies on it, rules of behavior. If you want to be our ally, act like it. If you want to be America's ally, act like it. If you want to cash our check, Act like an ally and behave. At the very least, shouldn't there be some rules and restriction on who gets it? While there are reasons for why they're burning the American flag, I'm an American and it upsets me. I'm bothered by the fact the American flag's being bothered, being burned, but I'm also bothered by the fact that we're sending money to countries where this is occurring. We're faced now daily with tens of thousands of protesters in these Middle Eastern countries. We're faced with the tragic assassination of Ambassador Stevens. And with all the aid, with all the evidence that foreign aid isn't working, that it enables dictators, rarely buys the behavior we want, still both Republicans and Democrats clamor for more aid, and they will fight tooth and nail against any restrictions on the aid. So you wonder, where are we going? In fact, you will find in this argument, and if you will read the paper, you will find that Secretary of State Clinton is today arguing for more aid to Egypt. See, their argument is, if a country doesn't like us, if they behave illy towards America, if you give them more money, maybe they'll react better. I think kind of the opposite. One, we're out of money, we're a trillion dollars short. I think maybe if we give them less money, they might think more about their behavior. Perhaps if we gave less money, or in my mind, no money to Pakistan until Dr. Afridi is released, maybe he'd be released. It boggles the mind 
to think that these senators are in favor of no restrictions and actually increasing aid despite decades of evidence that foreign aid isn't working in our country. Proponents of this aid continue to argue that these mobs will be more inflamed if we don't give them money. I think it's quite the opposite. I think the other thing about it they don't quite get is that I don't think the people rioting are rioting saying, give us more aid. What they're rioting for is that they don't like what our aid did in the first place. They're rioting against autocratic, authoritarian governments that were propped up by our aid. So the people who argue that taking away the aid will inflame the, Ameri the Arab world, well, for goodness sakes, turn on the television set. They're plenty inflamed. Now, taking away their aid doesn't make it better immediately either, but you at least have some consolation that we're trying to do something about the deficit and that maybe we have problems at home that are more pressing than this and that maybe we won't reward bad behavior. But to say that taking away the aid may inflame the Arab world, you need to turn on the television set because they're plenty inflamed already. But if you don't understand why they're inflamed, if you don't understand the Arab Spring, if you don't understand why they're mad, that they're mad because we propped up dictators that kept them down and kept them from freedom, you'll never understand or come to a resolution to make things better. I, for one, will not vote for one more penny. I will not vote for one more penny of foreign aid to anyone unless it has restrictions on it. And I will only vote on it if the restrictions say you have to behave and it has to be approved by the Senate. We've tried it before. The other side may come to the floor and say, oh, we have restrictions on aid. Foreign aid already has restrictions. But yeah, they're not working because we gave them to the executive branch. Like so much in this body, we've been giving up power to the presidency for 100 years. This isn't a Republican-Democrat thing. This is just a legislative abdication of power, and we let the president do whatever he wants. I don't, I'm not arguing Republican or Democrat. I'm arguing any president. The power should remain here to the purse strings. We should control them tightly, and we should say foreign aid only goes out under very strict conditions, and we shouldn't let the final decision be made by an administration that doesn't seem to have the fortitude to make these tough decisions. Enough's enough. We're running trillion-dollar deficits, and it's time to make a stand. So I've been making a stand for the last week, filibustering this bill. It doesn't make me the most popular person here in Washington. People's travel schedules have been disrupted because of my filibuster. People's campaigning has been disrupted because of my filibuster. But this is not a new problem, and it's not a small problem. We're talking about an aid program that's gone on decade after decade, we're talking about an enormous uprising in 30 countries, the Arab Spring, and now maybe the Arab Winter. And we're talking about how do we make things better. Until we fully understand what the Arab Spring's about, and also why the huge amount of anti-Americanism is running throughout the Middle East, until we understand that, we can't make it better. But I say throwing good money after bad is not the answer. So this evening, I think we will get to vote on my amendment. And my amendment is uh, to simply say to Libya, to Egypt, and Pakistan that there are restrictions. On all three, they will have to say that we will protect your embassy. There was a question of whether Egypt was forthcoming in protecting our embassy, and there's no question Libya wasn't. In the case of Libya, I think there are elements there that want to like America, there are also still elements that don't like America, but there's not really any government. So I wonder whether an embassy should be opened or reopened in Libya. My fear is that if you reopen the embassy in Libya and you put 50 Marines in there, that you may have a catastrophe like we had in Lebanon when we had 200 Marines killed back in the early 1980s. I think without thousands of Marines, I don't think you could protect an embassy in a large city in Libya. It doesn't mean we don't have relations. So when I argue for not putting the embassy back in, it's because I think long and hard about the danger to another ambassador and to what happens and what their family will have to suffer if another ambassador is killed. I also think that we can have probably an embassy in a neighboring country, and that's what I would recommend until things stabilize. If Libya wants to have aid, they should keep cooperating with us with regard to finding the assassins. They should 
try to work to where they can become stable enough to have an embassy. But the bottom line with Libya that a lot of people forget, as I talk about foreign aid, so many people are like, oh, we can't cut off aid to Libya. They want to be pro-American. They have oil. All throughout the bombing, when President Obama was bombing Libya, he kept saying, oh, it'll all be free. They'll pay us for it later. It'll be a free war. Well, we've heard that one before. Iraq was going to be a free war also that Iraq oil was going to pay for. Never ends up happening. But that's what they told us about Libya. With regard to Pakistan, I have one additional requirement. They have to protect and prove to us that they will protect our embassy. And they have to release Dr. Afridi. And I think this is very little ask. He's under death threats in prison. His family is under death threats in the countryside. They're living in hiding and living in fear because they helped us. The other reason why this administration should really take it personally is somebody leaked Dr. Afridi's name. His name should have never been known. I doubt it was someone with the CIA. But somebody who knew his name leaked this story. There were some stories about a month or two ago about how the president was doing a great job with terrorism. In those stories, it talked about a doctor with a vaccine program, and his name was found out. Somebody leaked those. Somebody very close to the president leaked those, and I think that needs to be investigated, and it's a crime, and it should be punished. But not only is it a crime, is whoever leaked that administration, well, whoever in the administration leaked that information about Dr. Afridi, I hope they lie awake at night and, and, and really worry about their soul in the sense that this man may well die. He's going to be in prison for the rest of his life because his name was leaked. That kind of behavior from high-ranking government officials is inexcusable. How much time do we have left? We're done. This evening we will have this vote. I will encourage the senators to vote for this resolution. It doesn't end aid. I would prefer we end it. This is a moderate step in the sense that it just attaches conditions to it. I think the American people expect this at the very least, and I encourage my fellow senators to vote for my resolution. Thank you, and I yield back the remainder of my time and suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.